<laughs> Praise God. We are, we're going to do some cooking in this kitchen tonight. Amen. <laughs> Throughout the years, many of us have been tremendously blessed by the words of the Lord that have come through Brother Copeland in prophecy. And I'm sure that all of you feel the same way that uh, I feel about what I'm about to read. You can go ahead and sit down. This is a prophecy Eight seventeen two thousand and twelve, 2012 on the deck at his steamboat Springs location at 10, 12 a.m. And it says, stay where you are, stay steady. Your greatest blessing ever is at hand. Satan tried to steal the word but he failed. No one can stop my plan for you. Your faith has caused it to be set, fixed, and established. Act it out. You'll be glad you did. I'm teaching you grace. Keep it on your mind. The thing that I can do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think is to make all grace abound towards you. And that's what is happening for and to you and your ministry and your family right now. So be blessed. Enjoy my grace. It's yours. Now, now I know that word was delivered uh, to a lot of partners and friends and you can say whatever you want to say, but that, that word was for me. And uh, I've received it and I have had, I have had a wonderful journey in this area of grace. And tonight uh, I'm going to start uh, a little three session series. I'm just I'm not going to finish it anytime this week, so I'll just go as, as far as I can and, and we'll believe God for the great teacher to show up and, and then stop when he says stop and then just, just and pick up the next time and just keep going. And, and uh, I, I, I am so excited about what I'm about to share with you. Now, what I'm about to share with you, if you, I'm going to submit some things to you. I'm going I'm to lay some things out for you. You might you might, uh, might not be able to swallow it all, but don't, don't allow what I have to say to you tonight. Don't, don't get mad at me and uh, become an enemy. I'm not going to be your enemy, don't, but don't get mad at me because I tell you the truth. If I start telling you that you don't love your wife because you don't believe God loves you, don't get mad at me. Just go ahead and receive what the Spirit of God want, what, wants to do for you. And we're going to have a wonderful time experiencing what God has to share with us. And, you know, dealing with the, the word of faith and especially at the Believers Convention, sometimes things were unfolded in these meetings that changed all of our lives. It allowed us to see some things that God was trying to get us to see. And so I'm going I'm to put it out there for you. You're going to have to consider it. And, uh, and we're going to still be friends afterwards. Amen. Amen. Mom and them, Pook and them, all of us, we still going to be friends. All right. All right. Smile big when you say that because you're that. Well, we're going to see, we see. Let's see what you got to say first. <laughs> Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, go with me to the book of St. John chapter one. St. John chapter one. Now, I call this over the next three days, we're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant of grace. But we're not going to, we probably won't get to Abraham tonight because there are some things that we've got to turn over and look at and, and, and go inside of it and take it apart and look at it again. 
Many Christians have been looking at the New Testament through Old Testament glasses. When we should be looking and we've got to come to the place where we see the Old Testament through New Testament glasses. Because in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, you'll see Jesus concealed. But in the New Testament, you'll see Jesus revealed. And we've got to, we've got to rightly divide the truth of the different agreements that are in the Bible. You have 2,500 years of mercy. You have the dispensation of the law. You have the dispensation of grace. And the two major covenants in the Bible would be the covenant that came by Moses and then the covenant that came by Jesus. And we've got to understand that how God operated in the old covenant or how God operated dealing with Cain and dealing with Abel and dealing with Adam and how God operates today is based on the agreement that was made for that dispensation. A dispensation is just simply the housekeeping rules for that time. And so if, if we don't, if we begin to take some truth from the dispensation of the law and try to apply it in the dispensation of grace, how many of you know that's like taking new wine and putting it in the old wine skins? It's just not going to work. And so we've got to properly uh, discern and understand the agreement and the covenant of the law and what God was committed to do under that agreement. And then we've got to understand the agreement and the covenant of grace and what God was committed to do under that agreement. And then we've got to understand what God was trying to do once Adam and Eve you know, ate of the forbidden tree. I mean, a lot of, for, for a long time, I saw God kicking them out of the garden. I, I'm thinking, now, God, why are you going to kick them out of the garden like that? I, you know, they did this, you kicked them out of the garden. That was an act of mercy. That was an act of mercy because as a result of what they did, had they eaten from the tree of life, they would have had to maintain that sin state all the rest. And the mercy of God says, I can't let this happen. So we're going to dig into these dispensations. We're going to dig into these agreements. You're going to see a God that will allow fire to come down from heaven. And then you're going to see under another agreement, the disciples saying, you want us to do it again? And he says, no, not this time. We're under a different agreement. If we do not understand these dispensations, and if we don't understand these different agreements, we could find ourselves operating in mixtures where we're applying a truth in one agreement under this dispensation and it's not working. And in fact, it's not even God at that time. And you're going to see the love of God and the mercy of God like you've not ever seen before. Now, I, this time, what I did, I, I put a handkerchief in my pocket. I, I, don't, I don't know what's been going on, except I'm just so in love with God that I find myself just weeping in tears, not a sadness, but a joy as I get in the word and I bump into more and more of what he has done and what he is doing. And I realize, I realize a lot of stuff God's telling me to do in the New Testament, like love your wife, like Christ loved the church. You can't do that until you learn how to receive the love that God has for you first. When you learn how to receive how much God loves you, and the overwhelming love that the Father has for you, now you can translate that love into other relationships that you have because now you understand the love that God has for you. But if you go trying to love folks and you, you, you don't even know how much God loves you, then you're not going to be able to do it. So let's look at all of these things and, and, and let's just go forward and, and somebody keep up with the time for me. If, it, if it's getting too late, just let old Creflo know and we'll do what we got to do, all right? Now, let's begin 
in St. John chapter 1, St. John chapter 1 and uh, verse 14. I was wondering if y'all were here this year. You didn't, you didn't get me that time. I'm going to tell you that right now. I was ready for you. You got me the last time. I almost turned white the last time you did that, but you. All right, look at verse 14 here. Verse 14. Does everybody understand where we're going and what we're going to try to get to? Verse 14 says this, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law came by Moses, but grace and truth, everybody say grace and truth. Grace. Now they're synonymous. Grace and truth came by Jesus. And so one of the things I, I, I want you to understand here is the, is is this wonderful picture of grace and truth, not just being a subject. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, grace is a person. Grace has a name and his name is Jesus. And Jesus showing up full of grace, full of truth, because that's, that's who he is. He is grace. He is truth. Praise God. And grace and truth came by Jesus while the law came by Moses. Now, I started to start with the law, but I wanted to start with what's been revealed in the, in the New Testament and then go ahead and see what, what, what we see that was concealed in, in, in the Old Covenant or in, in the Old Testament. Now, so grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, this grace. Let, let's talk about grace for a moment as we, as we go on. We, yes, praise God, grace is a person. But, but we understand, just very simply put, grace is unmerited favor. That's what it is. It's unmerited, it's unearned favor. Uh, some people say, well, grace is power. Now, grace will produce power. Grace will help you to do a whole lot of things. Uh, well, grace will help you to do everything. And, and that's really the point of where we're going. But it's unmerited favor. It's unearned, unmerited favor. Today in this dispensation, we all live under this dispensation of grace. And we all live under this wonderful covenant of unmerited favor. I'm going to prove to you that we have a covenant of unmerited favor. We have a covenant of unearned favor. So that means we have a continuous access to this unmerited favor of God. And yet in the face of Jesus, we see grace and we see truth and we have access to this grace and truth. So anytime you try to earn something, anytime you are working to deserve something, it's not grace. If you're working hard to deserve it, if you're, if, 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 you know, there's a difference between favor and favoritism. Favoritism, it, it, it just stinks with self-effort. It stinks with you doing everything you can do to get somebody to favor you. You're, you're working hard to deserve what you're trying to get to come to you. We're talking about doors opening for you in these last days that you're, tr you're going to sit down and say, dear God, how did that happen? And you'll recognize there's a loving Jesus working on my behalf. Now, I know it sounds strange, but in the Old Testament, we were working for God. But you're going to find under this covenant of grace, God's working for us. Now, let's look, let's look at some things here. Um, go over, because I don't believe Jesus came to give us more law. I don't believe it came to give us more law. Let's look at this. Galatians chapter 4. I 
I don't believe that was his, his purpose. And yet we're going to see that Jesus, of course, he was born under the law so he could fulfill the law. So he could do something that no man could do. That's why he's our champion. Let's start at Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So Jesus was born under the law so that he could fulfill perfectly the law, so that he could deliver his people from the law, so that they could get a hold of how much he loved them, and then they would receive his love, and then when they received his love, then they would be able to fulfill anything that needed to be fulfilled because love would be a fulfillment of all the law. Did you follow me on that now? All right, now watch this. But when, he, when, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to what? To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So now, now listen, so I know Jesus didn't come to give us more law if he came to redeem you from the law. Uh, literally, in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Amplified, he says that he came to purchase the freedom or to ransom or to redeem uh, for those who were subject to the law that we might be adopted and have sonship conferred on, upon us and be recognized as God's son. So there's a ransom that had to be paid. There was a price that had to be paid to deliver those who were in bondage to the law, to deliver them from the law. And notice he says, I want you delivered from the law. I didn't come to give you more law, even though I came born under the law so that I could feel the law, but I didn't come to, 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 to deliver more law to you. I came to deliver you from the law so you can become sons of God. And sons of God are led by the Spirit Spirit of God. So you don't need to be led by what was written on stones because once you become a son, then the Spirit of God moves on the inside of you and, and you begin to be led by the Spirit. You see, the, 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 the law can tell you not to commit adultery, but it can't help you love your wife. Something interesting about the law, the law, while it is perfect, cannot make you perfect. The law, while it is holy, cannot make you holy. In, in fact, this whole deal about being a son, let's back up a little bit. Uh, let's, let's back up to, to Galatians chapter 3. Look at this. Because this is one of those, those areas where we've looked at it uh, one way, and, and it may be all right, the revelation that may have come over the years over it, but I want to look at it exactly how it's put here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, he says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us under Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law served as a tutor. The law served as a schoolmaster. The law served as a schoolmaster until faith comes to bring you under faith right now. He goes into Galatians chapter 4. He's coming out of this about the law being our schoolmaster. And then he says, For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's what? Seed and your heirs according to the promise. Now watch this. Let's move right into Galatians 4. Now I say that the heir that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now, my whole time, I thought, well, now we're getting ready to talk about spiritual maturity. But look at what he just finished talking about. He just finished talking about the law being a schoolmaster and tutoring us until faith come. And then the heir, as long as he's a child, 
difference nothing from the servant, though he be Lord of all. Well, I want to know what makes this heir a child. Is it because he's two and still eating baby food? Or, or is it another reason why he's a child? All right, look at this, verse 2. But this heir who is a child is a child, notice, is under tutors and governors until the appointed or the appointed, until uh, time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now look at this. Listen to this. I'm going to read it out of Amplified and then we'll put it together. But this child is under guardians, administrators, trustees, until the date fixed by his father. So we Jewish Christians also, when we were minors, were kept like slaves under the rules of the Hebrew ritual and subject to the, element, the elementary teachings of systems of external observations and regulations. What is he making reference to in verse, verse, uh, verse 3? The law. The law. He is saying this, you're a child because you're still enslaved and in bondage to the law. And even though you are an heir, if you're still under the law, you're no better than a servant because you're like a child still being tutored. All right, now watch this. So he goes to verse 4 and he says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law so he could redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, you are an heir of God through Christ. Well, the reason why you're no more a servant is because Jesus has come to redeem you from the law. And now that you have been redeemed from the law, you are adopted as a son. And the spirit of God is now going to lead and to guide you and not a law. And you're not going to be a child under the law. Now that you're born again, you don't need, now that faith has come, you don't need to be tutored by the law. All right, now listen, your sin consciousness all throughout the night is going to be talking back and forth to you. Well, what do you mean we're not tutored by the law? Listen, you have something so much better than the law. You have the Holy Spirit who's going to write who's going to write the new commandments on your heart and he's going to lead you and he is going to guide you. The Holy Spirit will give you the advantage. For example, if you go in a store and you open a package up in the aisle, you know, you go to some store and you open it up and you look at it and you're like, well, I don't like it. And you put it back in there just like it is. There's no law that might be against you doing that, but the Holy Spirit will start talking to you and say, pick that package up. Don't put that thing back like that. You open it up. You need to go ahead and buy. Don't do something like that. See, he'll start talking to you. You don't need the law anymore because the Holy Ghost will start talking to you. He'll start talking to you. Go in there and hug your wife. You need to hug. She's been missing you. You need to spend some time. Just hold her about three or four or five minutes. The Holy Spirit will start doing stuff for you that the law can't do for you. See, as long as you're under the law, you'll still be asking questions. Is it all right to drink wine? <laughs> But once you're no longer a child, then you can ask the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, can I, can I drink some wine? See, that's between you and the Holy, the Holy Ghost will start taking you step by step. See, as long as you're under the law, you're looking for a rule and you're looking for a regulation to try to justify what you do. And God is trying to bring you out from under being led by a law so you can be led by the Holy Spirit so he can take you into deeper waters. Mm. You, 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 you follow what I'm saying? So, I, listen, for some reason, people think, well, you know, he's talking about grace. That means you can go and act wild and just do anything you want to do. I don't know what kind of grace you've been talking about, but the type of grace I'm talking about, when, listen, the grace of God, when you, get on, when you really get on the grace of God, you don't sin more. You sin less. And Titus chapter 2 says the grace of God will teach you how to live godly. It'll teach you how to live righteous. When you're really under the grace of God, the love of God is so strong that it constrains you. You ain't going to want to do what you used to do because you, you start checking out, look at what Jesus has done for me. Yeah. 
Everybody with me? So we're, we're, we're delivered. We're delivered from the law. Now, as a result of the ransom that was paid, as a result of what Jesus did, our relationship with the law has changed under this covenant of grace as a result of what he did. We can't keep mixing it. We cannot keep saying, I'm saved by grace, but I live by the law. You can't keep, and that's what we keep doing. Oh, I've been saved by grace, but I live by the law. I, I live by meeting the, the requirements of the law. I, 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 re, I live by, by um, my own self-effort. See, the law was all about do good, get good, do bad, get bad. And we're still doing that, in a sense. We're still doing that. We want, see, see you, you still think that God is good to you because you're good. God is not good to you because you're good. God is good to you because God is good. All right, let me, let me slow up. Uh, so let's look at our relationship now as a result of what Jesus has done, this relationship to the law according to the New Testament. Um, let's go to Romans chapter 6 and let's just kind of go through this real quick. Romans chapter six. Is everybody with me? I want to take you on the journey with me. And if I got to make sure you stay on the bus. Romans chapter six. Let's look at verse 14. Uh, let's read verse 14 out loud together. Ready? Read. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. For you are not under the law. Did you notice sin shall not dominate you now that you're under grace? Sin shall no longer dominate you now that you're under grace. Now, it was dominating you under the law. It was. The more you tried your best not to cuss, trying to use your own willpower not to cuss, and Jesus was nowhere in trying to help you not to cuss, you was just going to try to make yourself not cuss, you cussed the more. <laughs> so, under this dispensation, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because we're, we're not under the law. We're under grace. So there's something we can expect now being under grace that we're not going to be dominated by sin. Why? Because we're under grace. All right, now look at uh, Romans 7. Let's check this out. Verse, verse 4. I always like to read the whole thing on this one. This is so good, this parable here. Verse, verse 1. No, 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 you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dom dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress. Through, uh, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should marry, be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God. He said, you can't call that woman an adulteress if her husband is dead because if her husband is dead, then the law concerning that is dead and she's free from it. And he said, likewise, you are free from it because God Jesus, Jesus has died for you and now you're free to marry another. Who? Jesus. All right. And look at verse six. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The amplified. But now we are discharged from the law. We are discharged from the law. We are discharged from the law and have terminated all intercourse with the law, having died to what once restrained and held us captive. So now we serve not under 
obedience to the old code of written regulations, but we serve under the obedience to the promptings of the Spirit in the newness of life. You are no longer under the law. All right, let's keep going. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 4. How many of you so far are convinced by the scriptures that we've read that we are not supposed to be living under the law? You're convinced of that, right? All right, let's keep going. Verse 4. Ready? Let's read verse 4 out loud together. Ready to read. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So where righteousness is concerned, Christ is the end of the law. Now that you're born again and Jesus is the Lord of your life, Christ for you, for you who are born again, Christ for you is the end of the law. So your righteousness is not going to be based on your works. Your righteousness is not going to be based on your effort. Your righteousness is not going to be based, your righteousness is going to be based on Jesus. We've got to have more faith in what Jesus has done for us than we have more faith in what we're doing for Jesus. All right, let's keep going. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Let's look at 10 and 13. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that, that, that uh, continueth not in all things which are written in the book of of the law to do them. In other words, if you're convinced in living by the law, you got to make sure you do all, all of it. Uh, James chapter two, I believe, believe verse 10 says, if you offend in one, then you offend of the whole, you offend in the whole thing. And uh, the Amplified, I like to read this. He says, and all who depend on the law, who are seeking to be justified by obedience to the law of rituals are under a curse and doomed to disappointment and destruction. For it is written in, in the scriptures, curse a curse devoted to destruction, doomed to eternal punishment to everyone who does not continue to abide and live and remain by all the precepts and commands which is written in the book of the law and to practice them. But then in verse 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Christ has redeemed us. I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. I've been delivered from the law, redeemed from the law, not under the law. And Jesus had everything to do with it. Come on, let's keep going. Galatians, while we're there, look at verse 19. Now, Galatians verse 19, from this perspective, is going to tell us the purpose of the law. You know, many people think, well, you know, God was just so in love with us that he gave us the law so we could have a step-by-step, -step, you know, 10 steps to be able to live life. And that ain't why he gave the law. He gave the law to upset you, to bring you to an end of yourself. There were things about you that you thought was all right and you didn't think you needed Jesus because you were all right. You might not have been as good as the next person, but you were all right like you are. And if God going to you know, do what he did with this person, then he might as well do that to you. And he had to bring you to an end of yourself. You were, you were comparing yourself uh, uh, with, with others, you, 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 with other people. And, you, and that's not even wise. I, we'll talk about that a little later, but... It, that's not why the law was given. The law wasn't given because God looked down and Cecil B. De, uh, uh, B. DeMille's Ten Commandments and said, oh, the people are so sinful. I better give them the law. <laughs> Listen to this. Look what he said in verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? What's the purpose of it? It was added because of transgression till, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. There were, they, these guys were doing things before the law. They didn't, they, their, their sin that they were doing, they didn't know it was transgression because there was no law. I hear people say, well, you know, Abraham lied and he was a liar. Well, he, he did lie, but it wasn't imputed against him because there was no law about lying. And you can't hold nothing against somebody without a law. If, if there is no speed limit in the city, you can't give me a speeding ticket until you make a law about speeding. I can drive as fast as I want to. Ain't no law. 
Uh, are, you, are you following what I'm saying? And so li li listen to this. Uh, I'm going to read this out of Amplified. He says, what, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added later on after the promise to disclose and expose to men their guilt because of transgression and to make men more conscious of their sinfulness of sin. They would had no consciousness of sin. And when the law came in, when the law came in, the knowledge of sin came in. And with the knowledge of sin came sin consciousness. And with the knowledge of sin came, came guilt. With the knowledge of sin came condemnation. Oh, well, what's going on here? Why, why, why is this happening here? Because he's trying to bring you to a point where you will recognize that there's just no way I can do all of this. I need a savior. There's no way I can do all this. I can't keep this or I can keep this for three months and then I end up falling after the fourth month. I, I, I need Jesus. That's, God hid Jesus in all of the sacrifices and in all of these things in the old covenant, Jesus was hidden right in the midst of all that because the answer was always going to be Jesus. Uh, Y'all don't hear me. Come on, let's keep going. Romans chapter five. Look at this. I ain't even started yet. I'm just trying to get, get our minds set in the same place. Romans chapter five, verse 20. Now look at this. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound or increase. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So notice in verse 20, but the law came in only to expand and increase the trespass, making it more apparent and, a, and an exciting opposition. That's why the law was given. The law, literally here in this verse, it says the law was given to increase sin. Wasn't given to stop it. It was given to increase it, to make it more apparent. He's trying to get these folks uh, to understand. Wait a minute, guys. Don't mistake my lack of judgment in a time of mercy for approval. And that's what was happening. They were mistaking to because, I mean, in the beginning, man, there were 2,500 years of, of mercy. And when you get to looking at this mercy and you're looking at this, this grace, even in the old covenant, they thought, well, God's lack of judgment is God's approval. And God's like, uh-uh, that's not what this is. And so I've got to judge this thing. I've got to put something in place where you can come to the end of yourself where you know you got to have me. And this is God's joy. joy God loves to be trusted. He loves to be relied on. He loves for somebody to lean on him and depend on him to take them through whatever they're going through. Oh, praise God. Come on, let's keep going. I ain't ready to preach yet. I still got to keep talking about this. Romans 7 and 9, almost. Romans 7 and 9, for, listen to what Paul said. Paul said, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, watch this, sin revived and I died. Look at, look at the revival that was started by the law, a sin revival. A revival of sin that started by the law. And what do you think will happen and, and basically, in a lot of churches, it already happened. I notice in, in, in teen ministry, we we're, we're, we're keep trying to bring our teenagers back in the bondage of the law by giving them a set of rules and regulations for them to fulfill instead of teaching them how to follow and be led by the Holy Spirit. And what's happening is you're asking them to do something that they cannot do. You're putting them back in the same situation that Jesus had delivered people from. And you're telling them to keep the requirements and you're telling them to, to, to do this and to do that. And, and they're trying to do it. They're good kids. Except you're not teaching them be delivered from that and let me show you how to walk with the Holy Spirit. A spirit-led life versus a law-led life. Are you hearing me? All right, let's, let's keep going. I need to answer this question because I've been so hard on it. Well, Brother Dollar, is the law bad? No. 
No, no, God, no, it's not bad. Look at Romans chapter 7 and 12. The, the, the law came from God who is holy. The law came from God who is perfect. The law came from God who is good. Look at Romans 7 and 12. Wherefore, the law is holy and it is, and, and the commandment is holy and it is just and it is good. Somebody said, what are you talking about? Well, if the law is holy and it is just and it is good, then why don't we just continue to live on it? See, here's the deal. The law is holy. It is just, it is good. The problem with the law is that we can't keep it. The law is perfect. The law is flawless. It's not like, you know, under the law, you know, when, when you get stopped for speeding or you get, you know, stopped for doing something you're supposed to do, it's not like, like you can say, well, can you give me half a ticket? <laughs> give me credit for not going, you know, 50 miles over the speed limit. Are <laughs> oh, you understand what I'm saying? It was good. It was right. It was perfect. It could never make us good. It couldn't make us right. It couldn't make us perfect. But that was the flaw. That was the fault of the law. The fact that we couldn't keep it. And God didn't want us to be at that disadvantage because he loves us so much. Look at this. And then we'll, 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 we'll look at some other stuff. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 2. I want to show you what frustrates the grace of God. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness could, could, if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ just wasted his time on the cross. It couldn't come by the law. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. Somebody says, well, well what does it mean to frustrate the grace of God? It is because what Jesus did on the cross to set you free from the bondage of the law, it is when you return back to the law, trying to do good, to get good, when you return back to the law, trying to, ref, trying to fulfill requirements of the law, it's when you go back to the law, trying to accomplish things with your own self-effort. Now listen to me closely. Self-effort doesn't mean no effort. Self-effort is all about who you depend on. When you depend on God, to get the job done, that's not called self-effort. But when you depend on yourself and your education and everything you can make happen, not depending on God as your source, then that's self-effort. But I don't want to, you know, teach to the point where you think, well, you know, when you hear self-effort, that means just sit there and don't do nothing. I ain't doing nothing. Why? Well, if I do something, it'll be self-effort. That ain't what I'm talking about. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Abraham... Abraham had two sons, right? Now, I'm not trying to be vulgar, but this is a good illustration. You need to get this. Uh, Abraham had to have sex with both of them. Abraham, if he didn't have sex with Ishmael's mama, Ishmael wouldn't be there. Somebody said, well, but he was under grace with Sarah. But God still had to cause something to happen up in that tent. And Abraham still had to have some effort up there in that tent or Isaac wouldn't be there. So we're not talking about no effort. We're just talking about making sure you know who you depend on. Okay. Somebody say, I depend on Jesus. Some of y'all were turning red. That's your wife you're sitting by. What's the matter with you? You need to be believing God for whatever was in that tent with Abraham and Sarah to go and show up in their hotel room tonight. What you say now? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, now, now here's what I want to do. Let's now look at this new covenant. What is this new covenant? And then once we get the glasses of the new covenant, let's go over to the covenant of the law and see what we could, can see now that we have the glasses on looking from this perspective. Let's go to Hebrews chapter eight.
I had to learn as a pastor, and it's not with, with all pastors, but I had to learn as a pastor and, and where I, we started our first church that, uh, you know, I was a Baptist preacher. And in the Baptist church, we would have to tune up when that Hammond organ came on because we just couldn't teach and go from scripture to scripture because people didn't want that. They wanted to have a little, little sugar with their meal. Amen. And so we were taught that we had to go to the cross and we had to we had to put him on the cross and we had to we had to, to, to take him down to the grave. And we had to go there for three days and three nights. And then on the third day, uh, early Sunday morning, we had to raise him up. You understand what I'm saying? Then we had to seat him on high and hallelujah. And one day he's coming back again. Oh, la ha. But what happened was. But what, what happened was in the black church, black folks had been hooped at and moaned at and shouted at for so long, they weren't hearing nothing. And they were just sitting there nodding, waiting on the show to start. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ha. And so one guy did a little, little experiment. He came in and told the other preacher, said, I bet I can make your church shout and I ain't even got to preach out the Bible. And he started preaching just on pots and pans. And he told the church up. He said, ah on Thanksgiving morning. <laughs> Mama get up and get the pots <laughs> oh, <la -ha> -ha. <laughs> out of the cabinet. <laughs> and then she would take that butter and grease that pan. <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> and after a while, <laughs> when she greased that pan, <laughs> she set the oven <laughs> on bake uh, 450 <laughs> oh loud <laughs> then she stuck it uh, in the oven <laughs> you don't hear me y'all <laughs> and the ham and organ da na na oh loud da na na and shout and told the whole church up and didn't say no word didn't say nothing about Jesus didn't say nothing about nothing and so we realize black folks been shouted at, they've been moaned at, they've been groaned at, but they, they not, not, you can't, you, 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 they gotta, you gotta learn something. You gotta, you gotta learn something. So I had to calm myself down so I could turn from scripture to scripture to say, here it is, read it. See it, you see it right there? Let me explain this to you. Let's go to the next point and let me explain this to you. Because if you don't, listen, you got to know what to do when the devil show up. He not gonna move just cause you shout, moan, and groan. You got to know what to apply in your life life to get some victory in your life. So that's why I teach the way I teach. I have to take my time and show it to you because it was just one black folk. Some of these white folk were trying to do the same thing in the assembly of God's and you weren't learning none either. <laughs> oh, loud. <laughs> oh, I done got too honest tonight. I'm going to got too honest now. I'm going to get letters for that. I ain't going to read them. Don't even waste your time. Don't even waste your time. I'm not going to read them. Well, I'm going to write you a letter. I'm going to Facebook you. I ain't on no Facebook. I don't do Facebook. I have somebody to put them scriptures up there. I don't even want to look at Facebook. Ain't nothing wrong with it, but I, I, I just, I can't I handle all that. I don't understand to this day why people want to put all their business on a social network and let everybody know what's going on. I don't get that. I don't understand. Maybe that, maybe that is a sign that I'm getting older, but I don't understand why you would want to walk out and say, going to the store, <laughs> buying some meat, leaving town for five days. Now, if I'm a crook, I'm going to go to Facebook to see who I'm going to rob. And now they got pictures and you're showing all your business on it. And it's just, you know, when we, have, when we have things at the house, I got to check all of our younger relatives out because I got to make sure who got phones. Y'all know don't take no pictures here. Don't take no pictures here. You just took a picture of me. Don't put that picture nowhere. I didn't have to do that before, but now you got to do that because people be knowing what's going on in your own house. Because you got pictures in what is it, Instagram and all that, you know, I, you know I, so I just ain't a part of it. I, I just, I started to get a beep and just turn my phone back in. I just. <laughs> well, you need to catch up with society. I know, 
I know, I'm a dinosaur, but, I'm, but, I, but my privacy is still intact, praise the Lord. <laughs> at least I hope y'all might know something more than I do, amen. All right, now, let's look at the New Testament in light of everything. Do you understand now our position with the law, right? All right, well, we are not under the law, but we're under what? Grace. We're under the dispensation, the housekeeping rules of grace. All right, now watch this. Verse 6, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless. Now that first covenant is referring to that covenant that came by Moses. That first covenant is referring to that covenant that was given at Mount Sinai. That first covenant is referring to that covenant of the law. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now it's not me that's finding fault with it. It's what we're reading here. Look at the next verse. For finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a, come on, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. Now, I like this. He says, I will make and ratify a new covenant, watch this, or an agreement with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's going to make a new agreement. A new agreement. And that's what a covenant is all about. It's, it's an agreement between two or more parties to carry out the terms agreed upon. And based on the agreement, it's going to determine how, how you see our God doing stuff. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. It depends on the agreement that we find our God doing things. Let, let me give you a little, little example here where, where this agreement is concerned. Go to 2 Kings chapter 1. I mentioned it earlier, but let me show you this. 2 Kings chapter 1. Now, this is dealing with Elijah and, and this prophecy that he, that he gave Hosea, Haziel, whatever his name is. He gave him a prophecy and, and spoke some things. So I want to move straight down to verse 12. He says, and Elijah answered and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Now, if you're not careful, you'll come over in this dispensation and you'll use that scripture to put fear on people and say, let me tell you something. You better watch out now how you talk to me. I'm going to ask God to bring fire down. It's going to burn up your whole neighborhood. <laughs> but now watch this now. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, flip over there. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Verse 51, here's James and John being rebuked by Jesus. Verse 51, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? But he turned and he rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. You don't know that you are, you are from the spirit of the law. Look what he said. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. We don't have to burn them up. They can get saved now. They can get born again now. We're under a different agreement now than they were under in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings, that judgment had to come to pass. But right now, Jesus has taken all of your sins and it's been imputed on him and men can get born again and they can change and the Holy Spirit can transform them. You seeing that? Now, go back to, uh, who, where were we? Well, I got you all over the place. Yeah. Hebrews 8. Go back to Hebrews 8. Mm -hmm. All right, now, what? Uh, ooh, Jesus. 
Oh, boy. All right. So it says, I'm going to make a new covenant and a new agreement. All right, look at verse 9. Just focus with me for a moment. I'm getting ready to say some radical stuff here now. Look at verse 9. I'm going to make a new agreement, but I'm not going to make it not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they committed not, they were, they, 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 they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant, but it's not going to be according and it's not going to be like the old covenant. He says, I'm not going to make a covenant where when I led them out of Egypt, they didn't continue in the covenant, so I couldn't continue. Listen to this in the Amplified before I say what I'm going to say. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers on the day when I grasped them by the hand to help and to relieve them and to lead them out from the land of Egypt, for they did not abide in my agreement with them. And so I withdrew my favor and disregarded them, says the Lord. He says, I am not going to make another covenant where a man gets to decide what happens with my faithfulness. Come on. I'm not going to make another covenant where I've got to uh, abide by an agreement that I don't want to abide by. And so what the agreement was, you were not faithful to continue in the covenant. And so according to that agreement under the law, then what you do, I do. What, you, you do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. And what you do determines what I do. If you don't do your part, I don't do my part. I'm not going to make another covenant like that one. Come on. Amen. Thank God. I'm not going to make another covenant like that one. I am not going to make another covenant where your faithfulness gets to determine my faithfulness. Mm -mm. I, I, I don't think you guys understand what I'm saying. Because most of the church lives by this, this, this whole thing I'm talking about right now. You're, you're like, oh my God, if I don't do this, then God won't do that. And if I don't do that, then God won't do that. And if I don't come to church, then God's not going to bless me. And if I don't pray for five hours, then God's not going to deliver me. And if I don't do that, then God's not going to heal me. You're doing the same thing. And what you got to understand is, is I got to show it to you first. I got to show it to you first. First Timothy chapter uh, two. First Timothy chapter two. I, I got to show it to you first. See, I have to calm my own self down. God did something so amazing here, ladies and gentlemen. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. He did something so amazing here. It, it blew my mind when I saw it. He took man out from the center of the agreement and made him the beneficiary of his faithfulness so that even though you fail at being faithful he won't ever fail at being faithful and he will be faithful to you even when you're not faithful to him Now you ask me why I love this Jesus? Look at this, verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. The Amplified says, if we are faithless, if we do not believe and are untrue to him, he remains true and faithful to his word and his righteous character, for he cannot deny himself. In this new agreement, you don't get the opportunity to get what you deserve. In this new agreement, you get the opportunity to get what you don't deserve. God is faithful, man. God is faithful, you understand? God is so faithful. And listen, <laughs> he is, he's so faithful. <laughs> and this is the thing that'll get you, man. He's so faithful that you know when you didn't deserve it. 
and that undeserved favor shows up anyway. That's the stuff that, that you receive his love and that's the reason why you ain't got to worry about going and sinning more because look at what he did. Look at how he loved me even in spite of myself. He did it because I didn't deserve it. He did it because I didn't earn it. He did it because I didn't work for it. Look at what he's doing. Now what's happening to me? What's happening to me is my mind's being blown. How can you do this? You know I don't deserve this. He says, I know that, 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 that you don't think you deserve it, but that's what this New Testament is all about. It's about you having an abundance of undeserved favor. Well, I don't deserve to have a millionaire business. That's why you qualify for one. Well, I don't deserve to have a successful ministry. That's why you qualify for one. Well, I don't deserve to have this or to go that. That's why you qualify for one. You need to begin to believe God that I have an abundance of undeserved favor. Now, now watch this, watch this. Go back to Hebrews, go back to Hebrews 8, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 8. Ooh, Jesus. Now tell me when to stop. Is it time to stop? What, what? It's, it's time to stop. Oh, man, y'all don't want to hear no more of this. All we're doing is reading the Bible. Ooh, Jesus. Look at this. All right, so he's not, he's not going to make a covenant according to the old, because the old covenant of law, that's what that was about. The old covenant of law is you had to work to deserve it. The old covenant of law, you had to work to deserve to be righteous. You had to work to deserve to be blessed. You had to work to deserve to prosper. So what, what are we doing this one now? What are you telling us now? We'll watch this, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Now watch this. I will put my laws into their mind and I will write my laws in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Now, so far we see, I will, I will, I will. Look at him. I will, I will write my law. What law? The law of love, this new commandment. I'm going to write this law of love on your heart. I'm going to write this law of faith in your heart. I'm going to write this, 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 this royal law of love in you. I'm going to write it in you. I'm going to write it in you. And I'm going to write it on your mind. And then he says, I'm going to be your God. You know what it means when God says, I'm going to be your God? When you're sick, he's going to heal you. When you need to be delivered, he's going to deliver you because he is committed and faithful to be your God. I said, God is faithful to be your God. I said, he's faithful to be your God. So whatever situation you might be in tonight, you've got to know that a faithful God has committed himself to your life to be your God. Emmanuel is with you. God is with you. He is with you. He is in you. He is for you. He is one with you. Who can be, who can be against you when God has committed himself to be your God? All right. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. God says, I'm going to teach you to know me. God said, Here's what we're going to do. I'm trying to get this thing back to a personal relationship between me and you. And I'm going to walk with you. And I'm going to talk with you. And I'm going to walk and talk with you, not because you're flawless. I'm going to walk and talk with you because I'm faithful. <laughs> Do you understand that the first murderer, after he killed his brother, God was still talking to him? And protecting him and sticking up for him and saying, now you made a bad decision and, and that's going to cause some stuff to happen. But 
I'm going to be there for you. I got you covered. I'm going to put a mark on you. And when they see it, they know not to touch you. Now, that mark was not a mark talking about, well, the mark that Cain had on him was the mark that God put on him because it was a curse. And, and that's where black people came from. Black people didn't come from that mark. What's the matter with you? I ain't got no curse on me. Black people didn't come from no mark because Cain killed his brother. That mark was a mark to be seen by everybody to let them know, don't touch this dude, don't God go get you. I mean, all my life I heard, you know, the black man is cursed. I mean, look at Cain. Cain was the first black man. He's put the little mark on him and the black spread all over his body and all of that kind of stuff. And we bought that lie. No, I'm black because that's, that's just how God made me. And I'm, I'm black because God didn't want everybody. There wasn't enough room on the beaches for everybody. So he just made some people. He just made some people with a, with a tan. Just made a just, just came out tan. <laughs> All righty then. All right, now look at verse 12. This is the key. Verse 12 is the key to the New Testament operating in our lives. It starts with four. I, I believe in the Greek it may be because I will be merciful to your, their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Uh, now, 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 hold on. I will, I will, I will, I will, because you will believe that God has been merciful to your unrighteousness. And you will believe that your sins and your unlawful deeds, he remembers no more. I will write on your heart. I will write on your mind. I will be your God if you will believe that I have been merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and unlawful deeds I remember no more. And so when sickness may hit your body, you do not go back a year and say, well, maybe I did something to deserve this or maybe something happened for this to happen or maybe I wasn't this. No, 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 no. In order for him to do his job to be your God, you have to believe that he has been merciful to my unrighteousness and my sins and iniquity. He remembers no more. When the business deal didn't work out right, you don't go back and say, oh, but it must have been must have been how I treated that person. It must have been what I wasn't doing. It must have been it's my performance. I'm, I wasn't performing right. I, I needed to perform better. It must have been because I wasn't praying. No, 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 no. In that time, you must believe that he has been merciful to my unrighteousness and my sins and iniquities. He remembers no more. If you do not believe that he has been. Now, see, I know some of you thinking right now. Now, nah, wait a minute. You just see just all you're doing is just giving people license to sin. No, no, that's just sin consciousness you're thinking about. When you start seeing God's love for you, it, it'll, it'll restrain you. You ain't thinking about sinning. Ain't nobody thinking about sinning. I mean, look at what this Jesus has done for me. God's not imputing sin on me because he's already imputed it on the body of Jesus Christ. He'll never leave me nor forsake me because he left Jesus and forsook him. I don't have to go to hell because Jesus has already been to hell. Everything that I thought I would have to have, Jesus already did for me. There's not going to be any double jeopardy, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, we were put on trial. We were found guilty. The judgment was death. The sentence was death. The wages of sin is death. The sentence was death. And then Jesus stepped in and said, I'll pay the price. I'll pay the price. I'll pay the price. So I'm not, I'm not living my life worried about what's going to happen on Judgment Day. It's already been paid for. All right, every, listen, I have to have Jesus in my life right now. I am in Jesus. He is in me. 
I believe that he has been merciful to all of my unrighteousness and my sins and iniquities. He remembers it no more. He remembered it under the old agreement. Under this agreement, he remembers it no more. You keep going to God trying to get him to pull up what you did last night and he remembers it no more. If God has forgot it, you need to forget it and believe that he has been merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities. He remembers no more. And when that happens, I will, I will, I will. But for some of us, we're still dealing with, well, what about the sin? Well, what about this? Oh, Lord, I kind of know what Paul meant when he said, I got some things to tell you. You can't handle it, though. You can't. Nobody. Listen, let me tell you this right now. Your decision to sin may not unravel, will not unravel your righteousness, but it will unravel your life. Every time you make a decision to sin, it's going it's to unravel your life. Well, praise the Lord. The blood cleanses me. Yeah, but the popo will arrest you. <laughs> it will hurt people. It will hurt relationships. It will damage things. Nobody's giving you like this little free card. But there's something that happens when the sky is the limit and you choose Jesus. Something happens when the sky is the limit and I choose Jesus. It was amazing to me. I learned a lesson from my dog. I built this pen from it for him and I, and I put a nice roof on it. In fact, the roof I got on my house, I put on my dog's house. They had some stuff left over. I said, go ahead and put a nice roof over my dog's house. And uh, his name is Deuce. And I, I keep Deuce in the pen and when I let him out, he goes a running and he runs all over the place, just all over, going in the woods and just all everywhere, just act like he ain't got no sense, just going all over the place. <laughs> but I notice once I just let him stay out and the sky's the limit, guess what, dude, where, guess what Deuce is? On the front porch. <laughs> huh. Same thing with the little teenager who always getting a ticket driving. Time to look around, he get a ticket when he drive. Take him over to the raceway, put a suit on him and get him in one of the race cars. And say, now you can drive as fast as you can. Now he's saying, I might need to be a little slow on these curves because I don't want to wreck nothing. <laughs> I believe that we serve a God that wants us to want him and not just to do the religious things to purchase some fire insurance but I'm saved because I'm in love with a Jesus who paid the ransom so I can go free I'm saved because I'm in love with a Jesus who has been merciful to all of my unrighteousness I'm listen ladies and gentlemen I don't know about you but I Creflo a dollar. Soon to be Creflo. Well, I don't even say that. <laughs> I still need a savior. And when I think about his awesome love for me, you know, the, the word won't work until you realize how much God loves you. Until you realize God loves me, that's why I'm going to be healed. And really, that's incorrect what I just said. God loves me. That's why I'm already healed. Because healing is a part of the finished work of Jesus. Healing was not put in place the day you got sick. Healing was something that was accomplished 2,000 years ago. It's a done deal. It's an already done deal. Something that's already done. And I believe that when we are when we are committed to believing to believing that's why these faith conventions are so vital these believers conventions are so vital because without your faith you won't be able to apprehend what grace has made available for you 
Without your faith, how are you going to lay hold on the finished works of Jesus Christ? That's why these have been valuable for all of these years. So you can lay hold on the finished works of Jesus. But now here's what we have to lay hold on to. What the blood has done. He has absolutely delivered me from my sins. Heaven. Listen, how are you going to be concerned about going to heaven? Am I going to go to heaven? How are you going to miss heaven? If you're born again, you're already seated there. So why are you worried about going somewhere you're already sitting there? I've already been seated with him in heavenly places. Still trying to get God to do what he's already done. And he's done it, ladies and gentlemen. You are forgiven. He has been merciful to your unrighteousness. Your sins and unlawful deeds, he remembers no more. Now, instead of you being so sin conscious, where you leave from this place wondering, well, Ben, but what about sin? But what you trying to say then? Are you trying to say that we can just go out and do anything we want to do? See, that's that sin consciousness you got. And you're, you're missing the whole picture. Look at what this love has given you. Receive his love and you'll receive the necessary restraints. You'll receive the understanding of how to live godly because you're focused in on a God that loves you so much that he paid a ransom for you before you were even formed into a fetus. Yes. He will not impute sin unto you. Why? Because he's already imputed it on his son, Jesus Christ. And it's a done deal. Now, I know there's still some of you in, well, I got to earn it. Well, I still, like, I, I still feel like I got to work for it. Well, I still feel like I got to pray 90 hours. No, I'm, I'm not telling you not to pray, and I'm not telling you not to cooperate with the, with, with, with the things of God. I'm just trying to show you that God's trying to get us to a place where we can be led by the Spirit. And he can begin to teach us and train us and walk with us on a day to day basis and show us things that the law couldn't possibly show us. The law is inferior where it comes to being led by the spirit of God. And that's what he's trying to do. Get you to a place where you can live life being led by the spirit. That's what it's about. Amen. And there's a whole lot of things we need to talk about. I guess my time up because everybody walking now. So I, I guess I need to I guess I need to stop. They're like, well, you know, we love you, Pastor. You can stay all night if you want to, but I'm going to go home. I, I ain't hate yet. Did, did you get anything out of this tonight? <laughs>